Alex. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. I think uh, Paul's got a great presentation for us. So you're welcome. It, it might be boring. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, welcome everybody to the uh, May monthly meeting. Thanks for being on here. I'm sure some more people will trickle in. So um, just had some announcements. I'm going to share my screen because a lot of the announcements are, we have a lot of stuff going on in June here. So um, let me uh, put up this. Okay. Can everybody see that? How's it going? How's it going? Okay. So uh, we yep. have a lot going on in June. Out some in June, actually. So uh, just to kind of go down here. Um, tomorrow we have a mountain visit. Mountain visits mm -hmm. are networking for infielders. Uh, uh, we have anywhere from just a handful of people all the way up to 20 plus people uh, at times and talk about all things passive. Um, hey guys, can you mute your uh, mics, please? Um, and then uh, on the May 25th, we have a webinar that is for infielders only. And this is kind of an exciting um, online portfolio tracker that we're that some of the uh, founders have been testing out. We've been doing the using the, the beta version for this, and it tracks your your investment, your syndications. It can also uh, track your brokerage accounts, your crypto, cash, um, etc. So uh, it can attach to your bank accounts as well. So it's it's a really exciting platform that we've been trying out. And the company that's doing this is going to hold a webinar on uh, May 25th at 1:30 p.m. Eastern time. So I think it will be, it will be recorded. So you if you guys can't make it on, you can still um, uh, view the webinar, and then we'll give it, we'll give you guys a link to uh, test it out. And infield the infielders will be the final test for this platform, and then it's going to be a, uh, launched publicly. So you guys will be the first to use this uh, platform. That's uh, uh, going to be kind of a game changer for a lot of us who want to track our portfolios. Um, and then uh, on June 2nd, Thursday, we have uh, Jim Pfeiffer is going to be on the Confident Investor Mini Conference. Um, they're going to be talking about strategies for hands-off investing. So you can, you can go to their website. I think there was a link that came out this past week. Uh, someone needs a mute. Okay. Um, and then uh, there's going to be a passive investing. Uh, Com is going to do a webinar on June 3rd. Um, it's the uh, their um, uh, they're going to talk about their car wash fund. Uh, seems like car washes are getting popular these days as an alternative investment. And then Pat Wills is going to lead our his second uh, crypto bullpen meeting for infielders on June sixth. You want cheese on yours or what? how many do you want um, cheese on? <laughs> no. Uh, by the way, someone needs to mute, please. Steve, I think on, you have uh, the ability to mute everyone on, if you're the host. Okay, let's see here. Uh, uh, can someone give me, I don't know how to mute everybody. Uh, well, let's write it down. But anyway, um, on June 9th, we have our second Lunch and Learn. It's with Gary Lipsky from Break of Day Capital. He'll be talking about um, asset management for the passive investor. Our first one last month, month was uh, on, on uh, mobile home parks by uh, uh, WealthWord Capital, and that was a great success. I think we had almost uh, 60 uh, people on that one. So that's open to all left field investors. You'll get an invite uh, probably here in the next uh, few days or maybe next week. Um, and then our last monthly, I'm sorry, our next monthly meeting is going to be on June 27th, and that will be done by Paul Shannon, who's a, a left fielder, and he's a um, uh, with the Red Hawk Real Estate, and he'll be talking about analyzing multifamily deals for passive investors. So that's it for my announcements. Um, do you want to introduce our guest speaker, Paul Moore? He is the founder and managing partner of Wellings Capital. Uh, after graduating with an engineering degree and an MBA from Ohio State, he entered the management development track at Ford Motor Company in Detroit. After about five years, he departed, and he uh, started a staffing company with a partner. Uh, they scaled and sold the company to a publicly traded firm about five years later. So after a brief retirement in his early 30s, Paul began investing in real estate in 2000 to protect and grow his own wealth. Uh, he was, uh, uh, back in the mid-90s, he was a finalist for the Ernst & Young uh, Michigan Entrepreneur of the Year. 
he is a regular contributor to Bigger Pockets, which is where I first found out about him, um, and also on Fox Business. Paul is the author of two books. The first one is The Perfect Investment, Creating Enduring Wealth from the Historic Shift to Multifamily Housing and Storing Up Profits, Capitalize on um, America's Obsession with Stuff by Investing in Self-Storage. Uh, Paul hosts, co-hosted a uh, wealth building podcast called How to Lose Money, and he's been a featured guest on 200 plus podcasts. So he was also on our podcast on August 8th of last year. So he has had a successful multifamily investing career and now focuses more on self-storage and mobile home parks. So today he's going to talk about the joy of being a boring investor. So Paul, thanks for being on our monthly meeting tonight. You bet. It's great to be here. Can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. All right. Fantastic. So am I sharing? Do I need to uh, take uh, over the sharing here. again? Yeah, go ahead and um, do I'm that. I'm try think. that I'm again. Try. All right. I'm going to try to share my screen. And you guys can tell me if I did it successfully or not. Steve, you need to unshare. Unshare. Okay. Let's see here. Let's see here. Let's see if that worked. No. All right. That worked. Sorry. This is all new to me. Usually uh, Jim's. At the helm for this. He's, Sorry. He's going to love watching this part. Yes, I know. He's going to cringe. Yeah. Maybe you can edit it. Steve, at the bottom, there might be a, a stop share option for you. Right where the share screen button was. Original. Yeah, says yeah. share. Hold on a second. Let me, let me see here. Okay. Let me go. Continue. And let me go. that. And then let me get you the multiple uh, shares. So go like ahead. Go ahead, Paul. How's that? Oh, there we go. There we go. All right. Well, it's great to be here. And um, so we're, we're good. Everything's sound and everything's good. Sounds good. All right. Great. <clears throat> so it's great to be here. Uh, as, you know, I'm really, I really admire what you all are doing and Steve and Jim and everybody here because you are avoiding the one of the big mistakes I made. When I sold my company to a publicly traded firm, that was the, the good news. Uh, the bad news was I thought, I'm an investor now and I'm going to be a full-time investor. But I really wasn't. I was more of a full-time speculator. And there's nothing wrong with speculating as long as you know you're speculating. But I don't think I knew the difference. I didn't. You know, investing and speculating are different. We're going to talk about that this evening. But I can tell you that I made a good bit of money in those years, but I lost a lot of money as well. And when I hit my 50s, I decided, you know, I don't really like the idea of losing money. And now that I'm working with investors, um, you know, I, I definitely don't want to lose money. And so, um, hence the podcast, How to Lose Money, um, where we interviewed like 200 plus successful investors and entrepreneurs about their losses on the way to their success. So that's kind of fun. You can check that out on Apple and other places. But um, anyway, along the way, um, I, wrote a, I, I wrote a book called The Perfect Investment. And that is a book about multifamily investing. And I had this funny feeling that a lot of the multifamily investing we were we were starting to get to see around us was more speculating than investing. It didn't feel like investing anymore. And even though I had promised my wife, I'm not going to chase shiny objects. I'm not going to go do anything else. I'm going to stay in the multifamily lane the rest of my life. Well, I found out that uh, you know that I wasn't able to do that. And so we broadened from doing. Uh, multifamily into self storage. I ended up writing a book called Storing Up Profits. Uh, Bigger Pockets was kind enough to publish this last year. But um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is how and why you should consider becoming a boring investor. And so, boring investors, um, well, we're going to get into that in a minute, but Boring investors don't, um, this is probably not a great picture of a boring investor. I don't have any pictures of anybody on a yacht or anything, and I don't even like that whole scene. But we're going to talk first, before we get into boring investors tonight, we're going to talk about 
what is an entrepreneurial investor? So when I sold my company in 1997, I thought, hey, I want to get the same fun and joy and excitement out of investing that I got out of being an entrepreneur. And I found out that that was a big mistake. I thought, hey, this is so exciting. And um, entrepreneurial investors, I kind of made up this term. I'm not even sure if it's a real term, but I loved the thrill of the chase. Uh, I loved staying in startup mode for years. And what I mean by that is, you know, staying in that, okay, we're just getting this rolling. And once it got stabilized, I was kind of of the mindset that, well, maybe I can move on to something else and start something else, which wasn't the best, isn't the best path to wealth. Uh, start, entrepreneurial investors get a rush from the process. We repeat the learning curves a lot. Uh, got a broad, but not a deep a uh, swath of knowledge uh, about certain things, whatever I was investing in at that time. Might hit a grand slam, and I did that sometimes, but also struck out sometimes as well. Um, and boring, I mean, entrepreneurial investors, they typically speculate, and they may end up in a mansion, or they may end up working at Walmart after retiring. And there's nothing wrong with Walmart. But uh, it's just, I think you guys are probably part of left field investors because you want something more. So that's an entrepreneurial investor. That's honestly, I'm honestly a little embarrassed, but that's who I was. And, um, but today I am trying and my company is really trying to be a boring investor. I've been studying Warren Buffett and he is one of the most boring guys on the planet. I can almost guarantee that none of us could endure what his life for 60 something years, virtually none of us could endure it for even a week. It's so boring. It's amazing. And some of you probably know what he does, how is his rhythm, but his rhythm is boring. And I'm going to talk to you tonight about boring investing and why left field investors is a great fit for uh, teaching you boring investing. So I'm going to go through a bunch of different aspects of being a boring investor. And I'm going to develop all these, and then we'll do some Q&A at the end. So boring investors, first of all, attain true wealth. So the question is, what is true wealth? Is it mansions, cars, Tesla, Maserati, whatever it is? Well, no, those are signs of true wealth. True wealth is having assets that produce cash flow. And I think you guys all know that. But uh, Warren Buffett said, if you don't learn to make money while you sleep, you'll have to work until you die. And I don't think any of you want to do that. And I think that that's why, that, that's why left field investors is so powerful because you're teaching people to passively invest, not to work until they die, um, but to invest in assets like commercial real estate that's not dependent, the value is not dependent on a CEO scandal or a, a random tweet or a war in the Ukraine, or, you know, the mood on Wall Street today, the value is independent of most of those things. And so attaining true wealth, if you guys know the, uh, you know, the Robert Kiyosaki cash flow quadrant, this is placing you squarely in the lower right, where the wealthy seem to live, the truly wealthy. By the way, have you noticed how the wealthy don't they, they seem to tolerate lower returns and it seems strange to me for years you know like oh man I'm got, i got this great high returning asset this multi-family deal that we developed from the ground up in north dakota i'll tell you more about that later the wealthiest people weren't that interested in those high returns and it seems like they want lower returns and it's because years and decades of, and, and even generations of wisdom in some cases have told them that often those higher returns come with, you know, higher risk. The truth is low risk does lead to low return, but high risk doesn't lead to high return. It can, but it often leads to higher losses. In fact, even total loss. And again, I know you guys know this, but attaining true wealth often comes from being boring and investing in things that have a lower return. Paul Samuelson was the first economist from the U.S. to attain a Nobel Peace Prize. And 
he was talking about how important it is to be a boring investor. And he said, investing should be like watching paint dry or watching grass grow. If you want excitement, take $800 and go to Las Vegas. So boring investors often, or more predictably, I should say, attain true wealth. Speculators, sometimes they attain true wealth, but often the reason there's books and movies and, and stories told about these folks is they are the exception. And, um, but most of the time, boring investing, I think, leads to true wealth. It also leads to real freedom. William Green, um, I'm going to recommend a few books this evening. William Green has a new book. It's about a year old now called Richer, Wiser, Happier. And he was marveling at these people who are 100x millionaires and even billionaires who continue to you know, work 60, 80 hours a week just trying to, to do what? Well, I mean, if they're out there trying to make more money to give it away and to make the world a better place, I get it. But most of them, you know, are driven by something else. And it's usually something that doesn't lead to freedom. Um, I, I think we were put on this earth, and I think you all know this, for more. We were put on the earth for relationships. We were put on the earth for all kinds of things that are, you know, freedom giving. Uh, freedom from trading hours for dollars. Freedom from worrying about the price of your stock options or the crypto account or the next GameStop deal. Freedom from toilets, tenants, and trash. Freedom to use your time and money to make a difference in the world. And freedom, of course, from agonizing over every financial decision. Boring investors often enjoy real freedom. Boring investors also avoid hidden costs. Speculating often has hidden costs with it. So I, I would say, I mentioned earlier, I, I used to be a speculator. Investing is when your principal is generally safe and you've got a chance to make a return. Speculating is when your principal is completely at risk and you have a chance to make a return. Speculating seems more exciting. It seems like it's going to have a lot greater returns. But investing is I would say over time more predictably profitable and less stressful. And like I said, more freedom generating. Most of the world's wealthiest invest. And I think that's why you guys are a great, you know, that's why you're here at Left Field Investors to learn to truly invest. Because true wealth relieves financial risk along with financial worry, stress, and other freedom inhibitors. True wealth produces more time, more wealth, more focus more freedom and a better life. My friend Kevin was making over a million dollars a year as a tech guy out in uh, Seattle. And he, his company was paying him a, a lot of stock options. And then he turned a lot of that into stock. And he was obsessed with his stock price. I mean, he had this really, you know, this million dollar plus a year job, but he was also obsessed. He was losing sleep. It was hurting his relationships. It was hurting his job performance his productivity hurt, his health hurt. And it was all because he was obsessed with his stock prices and his option prices. I've noticed that people who are chained to a stock ticker, you know, and other exciting investments, they're not always fully present. You know, it's like that person who's checking their iPhone three times a minute. You know, they're not always truly present. We've all known for years that our most sacred and scarce commodity is time. But I would say now, with the invention of the iPhone in 2007, I wonder if that um, most sacred commodity is actually not time. It's actually a, a subset of time, and that's focus. You guys know what I'm talking about. Well, Kevin was unfocused. He didn't make a dime more on for all his worry. In fact, he thinks he lost money. He also thinks his net worth is much lower, his health, his relationships are not as good as they would have been. And he now has decided to outsource all of his investing. He, um, in summary, for time's sake, I'll tell you, he's decided to become a passive real estate investor. And that's how I know him. So uh, true, uh, boring investors avoid hidden costs. 
boring investors also lose money and make a fortune. I mentioned I have a podcast, I had a podcast for 238 episodes called How to Lose Money. And we learned a lot of lessons from a lot of great investors and business owners, entrepreneurs on this. And the one thing I will say this evening about it is they learned from their mistakes. And so I would say boring investors, rather than trumpeting all their successes, they learn from their mistakes. They lose money and they eventually make a fortune. And almost, I won't say everyone, but many, many of the people we had on our show said the turning point for the good was when they had calamity. So, you know, some of us experience, I mean, all of us experience pain in our lives. And the question is, will that pain make you bitter or will it make you better? And um, boring investors often leverage that pain and that loss to become better. Boring investors build franchises rather than custom cuisines. If you're going to take a restroom break or get a coffee or something, this is probably a good time to do it because this is really, this is a very hard point to get across. I'm going to try to summarize it. If you are a chef and you want to build this incredible restaurant, you're probably not going to do a Chick-fil-A or McDonald's franchise, right? Well, let's face it. And you guys all know this. These great restaurants in our towns, they come and go. I used to live near Dublin, Ohio, where Jim Pfeiffer lives. And a, my favorite restaurant in town, it was gone after a couple of years. And my favorite restaurant in my town has, you know, actually several of them have come and gone. But franchises seem to work out much better. The advantages of a franchise is, you know, you work hard, but you work hard, but the startup work is already done. The branding's done. Uh, you need little to no experience. You don't have to be a chef. You've got a set menu. Uh, there's significant buying power as a franchisor, but there's minimal flexibility. You don't, you know, you have to share a significant portion of the profits with a franchisor. You won't get to go to France uh, to acquire the beautiful furnishings for your French restaurant. Um, your business reputation partially depends on other franchise, uh, franchisees and the franchisor. And the franchisor uh, has all the decision-making power. You could even get fired. You know what? I still say, I don't, I don't know the exact number. I knew it at one time, but I think something like 88 or 92% of franchises stay in business. And a huge percentage of people who do the you know, custom cuisine don't. The reason I kept this point in there, even though this was kind of a hard one to communicate, is left field investors, you guys are living this because as uh, franchising is a little more boring, right? But if you wanted to create a custom cuisine, you might have a, a full-time job as an IT professional or a doctor, a dentist, a lawyer, uh, just a highly paid person, or you might just be retired. You might, you know, have a family you're trying to prioritize. You know, exciting entrepreneurial investors would try to take on all that you're doing and go out and invest in real estate on the side. That would be the custom cuisine because it's so much fun. Boring, the boring path would actually go, wait a minute, I don't think I can do it all and do it well. And I'm going to go to a place like left field investors to learn how to passively invest. Passively investing, just like with the franchise, it shares a little bit of the profits with the experts, but it's got experts in their corner. Um, uh, custom cuisine guys, you know, they want to do everything themselves, but they often don't do as well. They often don't make as much profit. And, you know, the, the, the uh, 80 20 rule is fractal. And what I mean by that is if you can get the top 20% of the top 20%, top 4%, right? Um, you'll probably get something like the top 80% of the top 80% of results. So 64%. So what I mean by that is it's better to share the profit, at least a lot of people think, than to try to do it all yourself and think you can do it well. And we're going to get back to that point later when I tell you about Michael Phelps. And so um, we'll jump into that in a bit. Boring investors invest in boring assets. Hey folks, what can be more boring than self-storage? When I first heard about value-add self-storage, I laughed out loud. 
I thought, wait a minute, where's the countertops and cabinets and appliances and Bark Park and all the fake flooring and all that fun stuff? You know, I mean, self-storage has four pieces of sheet metal, some rivets, a floor and a door. It's really boring. But Wall Street Journal and uh, New York Times said that self-storage roared out of the recession as the top performing commercial asset. There's other boring assets like mobile home parks, Sam Zell, arguably the top commercial real estate investor in America, maybe the world. He was quietly uh, acquiring mobile home park lots. He's got 155,000 lots and he's a billionaire. He's, he became a billionaire for a lot of other reasons, but um, his boring assets have made him billions. And now with the, the news out a week ago, I'm digressing from my script a minute here, with the news that the Biden administration is going to now give these large tax incentives and other incentives for manufactured housing. I mean, I heard, you know, earlier, Steve, you said you had somebody talking about mobile home parks. Check that out, folks, if you haven't seen it, because mobile home parks are a great but boring investment. Uh, boring investors invest in, invest in boring assets, and they also invest in the gold rush. Well, sort of. You guys all know the story. I think you do. So back in the gold rush in the 1840s and then again in the 1880s and 90s in Alaska, um, the people that made a lot of the profits, uh, the, the, the people that went for the gold rush, massive percentage of them, I saw this percentage before, um, they failed. They didn't strike gold. They didn't strike it rich, but they had so much excitement. Can you imagine the excitement of traveling from Connecticut to you know San Francisco area or worse yet to the Yukon area of Canada or Alaska? It's incredibly exciting. The boring investors though, they did invest in the gold rush, but you know where I'm going. They invested in hardware stores and transportation and motels and hotels. They were the boring investors and a huge percentage of them, from what I heard, made money, okay? And so the people, you know, that thought that they got excitement out of it, they're the people that often, and I don't mean to be so dramatic, but they often bled and died. In fact, a tiny percentage of people that went through the Yukon Pass actually made it to the even start mining gold. A lot of them turned back, a lot of them died. The, the analogy here is kind of cool, and that is the fact that a lot of real estate investors, especially those who have full-time careers somewhere else, get bogged down in toilets, tenants, and trash, and they end up miserable. They end up not getting the returns they expected. They end up getting 100% of a smaller number rather than, let's say, as a, you know, investing passively and getting, let's say, 80% of a much, much larger number. Like I said, the 80-20 rule is fractal. And it's possible that even if you could make the same or better returns, you might be having to give up a lot of your life to get there. You know, a lot of your time with your family, your job, your focus, like my friend Kevin. This is, again, the value of left field investors. I mean, teaching guys to invest passively. So boring investors sort of invest in the gold rush. They also have a long view. Warren Buffett was quoted as saying, my preferred hold time is forever. Day trading is a lot more exciting. Investing in GameStop and crypto, and I'm not against any of that, not at all. But it's, it's a lot more exciting than just holding a stock and never even looking. Buffett said he wishes the stock market would close for 10 years uh, on his, for his stock every time he buys into a company. Well. You know, when he bought into Apple at 20 bucks a share and it went up to 60 or whatever, he didn't care. And he doesn't care now because he's got a longer view. Um, in investing with a long view has less friction, less, less transaction costs, higher flexibility to catch trends. Longer term investors are more likely to catch, you know, in more inflation, more of a downturn. They have the flexibility to catch the market when it comes back up. And it's just a better way for most people to invest, even if it's not as exciting as quick flips. Speaking of interest rates, by the way, and inflation, um, I only know, Steve, I only know like two famous people. One of them is uh, the former head of HUD who happens to live 
uh, close to me, and I had coffee with him last Thursday morning. And he was the head of HUD for a couple years. And I said, what's going on? What, what do you think is going to happen? He was also second in command at Freddie Mac um, back uh, about 12, 15 years ago. And I said, what's going on? He said, well, um, Jerome Powell, the head of the Fed, is a disciple of Paul Volcker. And a few of you might remember Paul Volcker from the early 80s, the head of the Fed. He basically said, we're going to extinguish inflation at any cost, no matter how much we have to raise interest rates. Well, my friend Dave Stevens said he is a disciple of him and he will do that. And so that's just a little tidbit that's kind of off script here again. Um, and the question I would ask is, what can you do? What can we all do to beat this potential downturn that's going to result? And the answer is finding assets with intrinsic value. And that means not paying full price. Oh, you can pay full price. I shouldn't say that. But try to find assets, whether they're you know mom and pop owned assets, where you can harvest intrinsic value. And again, mobile home parks are perfect for that. 80 to 85% are mom and pop owned. There's 43,000 of them out there. Uh, there's 53,000 self-storage facilities and about one out of every two, about 50% are mom and pop owned. And this means they often, those owners don't often have the, the knowledge or the desire or the resources to find that intrinsic value, to harvest it, and to increase income and maximize ROI for their investors. Hey, they don't have to. Cap rates have already shrunk, meaning the values have doubled in the last several years of these assets. What that means is that they're already getting offers proving to them that even though they, many of them are mediocre, they're, they've got double the value that, that they went in with or double the value they expected seven years ago or whatever. So they don't have to make these hard improvements. These are hard things. But if you can buy or if you can invest with an operator that puts together a lot of these deals from mom and pops and then converts them into a nice franchise, if you will, and then sells that portfolio to a, um, let's say, an institutional investor, they can often get a significant premium. This is a great way to fight against a downtrend. This is a great way to fight against, uh, you know, a potential downturn we're going to have in the economy. And like I said, my friend Dave Stevens says there's a hundred percent chance in his mind that we're going to have a downturn. And uh, one good thing I will say, he, he said, you know, uh, rental real estate will do really well, even in a downturn. And I've got um, some other data on that. And you guys probably know this. So rental real estate is still in uh, short supply and high demand and will be even in a downturn. So boring investors have a long view and boring investors don't chase shiny objects. I've already talked to you about this. Um, I spent years chasing shiny objects as, you know, I, I wanted to have serial entrepreneur or full-time investor on my business card. Not cool. Um, it's, it's fine to be a full-time investor and even a serial entrepreneur. But for me, it was chasing a lot of shiny objects. A famous investor, you guys know the name, uh, George Soros said, if investing is entertaining, if you're having fun, you're probably not making any money. Good investing should be boring. Boring investors don't chase shiny objects. Boring investors also choose a lane and stay in it. Uh, a close friend of mine, Barry, uh, we were business partners a number of times over the years. He ran for governor of Colorado unsuccessfully. And he said that he mixed and mingled with all these billionaires, these high net worth people and really wealthy people. And he said, you know, they had one thing in common. They all stayed in a lane for decades. And a lot of them really got bored, but they stuck with it, sort of like Buffett has. You know, thir uh, what was it, three, three or 30? No, 3 million percent return, he said, while the stock markets had a 30,000 percent return. Did you know Buffett, by the way, Berkshire Hathaway can lose 99.2 percent of its value and still beat the S&P 500? Isn't that incredible? Uh, and that's proven, by the way, mathematically. 
Barry told me, he said, if he would have just, he's this incredibly successful entrepreneur, but he's not as successful as he could have been. And he said, one of the reasons is he just kept chasing shiny objects. And he also uh, didn't stay in one lane. Think about this. Speaking of lanes, Michael Phelps, to my knowledge, is the most decorated gold medal winner in Olympic history. He's got 27 gold medals. Imagine Michael Phelps when he started out, if he would have said, I think I'm going to, um, I think I'm going to do the long jump and swim and shot put and hurdles and all that. And I mean, you never would have heard of him. I don't think he was a massive. I mean, if you've studied his boring, incredibly boring life, uh, at least in the training realm, um, he was super hyper focused. And as a result, he's got 27 gold medals and the United States uh, has gets to enjoy some of that joy. Warren Buffett says, one of the keys to investing is staying inside your circle of competence. He said, it's not important how big the, the circle is. What's important is knowing your edges. Warren Buffett's partner, Charlie Munger, has a friend named John, I don't know how you say it, I think it's Arietta. Uh, and he decided decades ago that he was going to have a very small circle of competence. Check this out. He decided he was only going to invest in real estate within one mile, one mile of Stanford's perimeter of their campus, okay? So Stanford's campus, one mile out. And John Arietta, Munger's friend, became a billionaire, <laughs> literally doing that, just doing that. So what's, you know, what's John's, what's his specialty? What's his circle of competence? Is it real estate? No. Is it real estate in North America? No. Is it real estate in California? No. Northern California? No. It's real estate within one mile of Stanford's campus. And he chose a lane and he stays in it. Speaking of a famous guy who chose a lane at a young age, Bill Gates, love him or hate him, he chose a lane at a young age. And he took, a, he took knowingly or unknowingly a three-step strategy to become the world's wealthiest guy at one point. Uh, number one, he chose a lane at a very young age, and that was going to be computers. Number two, he found the biggest, most influential company he could find to partner with him, and that was IBM. Third, and this is where it gets funny, like it's not what you'd expect, and this is a little boring here, that's my point. Gates did everything in his power not to make Microsoft successful. He was more boring than that. He did everything in his power to make his partner, IBM, successful. And he was obviously, you know, he springboarded to the wealthiest guy in the world. So boring investors choose a lane and stay in it. But boring investors don't get the buzz of grinding harder. My coach tried to convince me of this some time ago. He said, hey, I've observed you. You know, you work a lot of hours. He said, um, what if you could clone yourself? You think you'd be better? I said, oh, yeah, man, it'd be so great if I could clone myself. He said, no, you wouldn't. It wouldn't work. He said, because if, you, if there was two of you, you would just take on at least twice as many projects. And uh, you would not be any further ahead than you are now because you're addicted to the, gr you're addicted to the buzz. And again, this is something I'm trying to get rid of. I'm trying to get to a place where I'm, you know, like a boring investor who doesn't get the buzz of grinding harder. What if we could petition God and get 10 more hours in our day? I'd love that. What if I could clone myself? I think I would. Uh, or would I really be better off though? I mean, I'd get serious about playing bass again. I might join a band. I might read more novels, travel more, watch all eight seasons of 24, pick up swing dancing, join an extra group, small group at my church, volunteer to feed the homeless people on Saturdays, learn a new board game and a new card game. Uh, I'd write an extra book. I'd start a daily podcast. I'd read more biographies, spend more time with my four kids, my wife, my friends. You get where I'm going? At the end of the day, I'd have more plates spinning than I do now, and I'd be even more stressed out. <laughs> but I, I would get a bigger buzz from grinding harder. By the way, I, I don't really feel that way anymore. This is kind of like the old, this was the old me, trust me. Okay, seriously. But that's, that's how I'm oriented. And I don't want to be that one anymore. I want to be a boring investor. And I don't want to live off the buzz of grinding harder. 
Boring investors suffer mockery and misunderstanding. This is interesting. Buffett in 1999 was called a has-been. He was only like 70. He was called a has-been. He was called senile. He sat around and watched the rising tide of the tech boom happen all around him. And his returns were terrible by comparison. And you guys probably remember this. Uh, Buffett was, they were whispering about him. You know, his friends were even whispering about him saying, it's too bad. Buffett just missed the tech boom. Buffett said, he famously said, I would rather invest in Wrigley's gum than I would tech because I don't know where tech will be in 10 years. I do know how people will be chewing gum in 10 years. The problem is right now, we're at a time, and Steve, tell me if you agree, where lucky amateurs are faring just as well as true experts. In fact, sometimes lucky amateurs are doing better because they're taking bigger risks. And this rising tide has given everybody a cause to celebrate. But Buffett said, someday that tide's going to go out and then we'll see who's skinny dipping. Okay. So exciting investors skinny dip, boring investors don't. And they often suffer mockery and misunderstanding like Buffett did along the way. I've got a lot more to say about that, but I'm going to move on. Boring investors live next door. You might not recognize them. Uh, the exchange right, if you guys know R-I-T-E, exchange right, check them out. If you ever need a 1031 exchange, they've got Delaware Statutory Trust, a uh, pretty cool company, but the two owners have given away $41 million in the past several years. One of the owners is an acquaintance of mine. I don't know him well, but he told me, he said, I live on a fraction of my income. I save enough to care for my wife and kids if something happens to me and I give away the rest. It's pretty impressive. $41 million he and his partner have given away and they're young. They're way younger than me. You're probably saying, well, that's not hard. Well, anyway, boring investors, they, <laughs> they don't chase the next shiny object. They don't do the day trading or whatever. They don't get a buzz from it. They don't, uh, you know, basically they free up their time, which means they have an opportunity to invest in another type of seemingly boring asset. And that seemingly boring asset, don't shout me down, is people. Let's face it, a lot of us get so much buzz from all the things we're doing that we tend to neglect our family. I know I made this mistake for years, but boring investors invest in relationships. I love Elon Musk, and I think a lot of us do. He's almost 50% wealthier, last I checked at least, than Jeff Bezos, by the way. But um, he's got multiple kids from multiple women who don't talk with him. I can't judge him. I've made the same mistakes. I have neglected my kids to an extent. I've neglected my wife. Our marriage was harder than it needed to be because of some of my mistakes, some of the long evenings and weekends that I worked. Um, I honestly have not. I, I do invest in relationships, but I don't think I've done it as well as I could have. And uh, boring investors, I've learned, invest in relationships. Boring investors are also go-givers. You guys probably know the Go-Giver book. If you don't, I'd highly recommend you check it out. But for those of you who do, uh, you guys remember the principles of a Go-Giver. They, they live in the, by the law of value, the law of compensation, the law of influence, the law of authenticity, and the law of receptivity. For time's sake, I'm going to buzz forward here. Uh, boring investors invest in silent solitude and Sabbath. I used to love Saturdays and Sundays but it wasn't for the reason you think. I thought this is a great day because I'm not going to get very many calls or emails or texts and I'll have more time to get more work done. I literally said that to people and I regret it now. I think I missed a lot of, uh, a lot of downtime with, you know, family and friends and I have learned to relax. I have learned to invest in solid, silent solitude and Sabbath. Uh, if you guys, you're probably familiar with Hal, Elrod, Hal Elrod's great book, The Miracle Morning. And The Miracle Morning is a, a great book that teaches this principle. There's another great book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And I'm actually in that book right now. And I uh, highly recommend that if you want to be a boring investor who invests in silence, solitude, and Sabbath, Sabbath 
and also someone who invests in happiness. If you remember one thing from this talk, this, this could really change your perspective on life. Check this out. A study says that once you, sur once you pass $95,000, okay, with inflation, I'm going to say a hundred. Once you pass about a hundred thousand dollars in income, you're not going to be any more happier, no matter how much you make. They argue that maybe they'd be a little unhappier if you made a lot more, but that's beside the point. So if you make a hundred thousand, you're probably about as happy as you'll ever be. If you make 200, 300, 500, 5 million, 10 million, you probably won't be any happier. Think about it. It's kind of boring to make a hundred thousand a year if you know you have the potential to make a lot more, but will you really be any happier? And if you're not going to be any happier, maybe you should think about taking a deep breath. I need to, I'm talking to myself now and spend some more time with family, friends, and doing things that are important to impact the world. Like investing in the unseen realm where there's apparently no ROI. I don't know how many of you heard of William Wilberforce. There's a great movie out about his life called Amazing Grace. William Wilberforce almost single-handedly took on the entire slave trade in the Western world, but for sure in the United Kingdom. And he started his campaign in, I think it was 1792 when he was about 24, 23 or 24 years old. And he, he gave his entire life, his wealth, his health, his reputation, Talk about mockery and misunderstanding. Oh my goodness. He gave everything. He's extremely wealthy when he started and he wasn't when he ended, but he invested in this unseen realm where there was apparently no ROI. And he went to incredible lengths to expose the slave trade in England. And he eventually, before he died in 17 or 1833, I think, he had, uh, the slave trade had been completely outlawed, not only the trade, but even the ownership of slaves. And then of course that came to the United States um, within about 25, 35 years later. And uh, so William Wilberforce is credited with that. He's not as famous as a lot of people who lived in that era, but he invested in the unseen realm where there was apparently no return on investment, but Literally the world, billions of people in the world, including everybody on this call, I would argue, has great reason to thank him. William Wilberforce invested not for a title, but for a testimony. Boring investors invest for a testimony, not a title. There's a lot of people through history, Wilberforce had a testimony, but a lot of people like the King of England had a title. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover had a title. Martin Luther King Jr. had a testimony. Pharaoh, way back in history, had a title. Moses had a testimony. And I would say boring investors often invest well for this type of testimony, for a life well lived. Boring investors invest to leave a legacy. We talked about William Wilberforce. I got some really bad news to end this talk on, and that is this. If you took the record profits, not the average, the record profits of Apple, General Motors, Nike, and Starbucks, and you added those together and you double that number, you would get the approximate annual profits generated by human trafficking around the world. There are more slaves than ever in the world. And this, it, it's, it's, it's happening right under our noses. I'd like to believe I would have supported William Wilberforce if I was alive 200 years ago. I'd like to believe that I would have been on the side of abolitionists if I was alive in the Civil War, but it's happening right now. And so my company, Wellings Capital, we're dedicating ourselves to try to make the world aware of the horrors of human trafficking and also to do something to fight it. We raised a lot of money on Giving Tuesday last year, and I'm hoping to do similar things this year. And so um, it's, it's kind of boring though. I mean, it's, we're investing in people we don't know that we'll never see, that will never be thanked. It'll never put gas in our car or food on our table or money in our IRA, but um, we're investing to leave a legacy. And that's what boring investors do. Thank you. 
right, Paul, thank you very much. That was awesome. Uh, not only on just investing, but also philosophy, your philosophy in life. I, I really love it. Um, Thanks, Steve. Yeah, that, that was fantastic. Um, well, uh, do you have some time for some questions, Paul? I do. Okay, well, well uh, uh, let's see. Why don't you guys, I think there's either raise your hand. Uh, I think you can, uh, on the reactions, if you want, if you have a question for Paul. Or maybe if, if you're shy, you can put it in the chat, I guess, too. Let me see. Yeah, feel free to read the questions to me. If I start reading, I'll get completely sidetracked. Anyone? Um, well, actually, I did have hey, a Paul, question. How... Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Ryan, sorry. Hey, Paul, uh, I, I tend to be kind of an entrepreneurial investor, uh, like, like you, chasing shiny objects. Yeah. What would you say is the top three tips that you would say how to, how, and I do invest in, in boring, but how do you allocate a percentage of your investments to the shiny object or that yeah. entre entrepreneurial or have you, okay, okay. I was looking to see how you, how you settle that side of your Yeah, natural, natural you know, thing. so um, I've come to the conclusion that, you know, being a better investor even if it feels boring, is more exciting. Uh, Buffett has made this really clear to me as I've read his stuff. And so that's one thing I did. Helping others and knowing that if I'm raising a lot of money or making a lot of money, I'm able to help, let's say, trafficking victims. That's a second way. The third way is actually a direct answer to your question, Ryan. And that's a really, really good question. And that is, what if you allocate a small percentage to speculative investments and yeah, I do. I actually have some crypto and uh, I actually am in a fund as well that's somewhat speculative in its nature, but I have a very small amount, you know, of my total assets in that. But uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Ryan, great, really seriously, great question. Um, let's see here. Sheila asked a question here. Uh, do you have a fund we can invest in or just give advice? And uh, I guess you want to just talk about Wellings Capital as an uh, investment vehicle. Uh, yeah, so we we have we've had five funds, and we've uh, invested in self storage, mobile home parks, multifamily, light industrial, and uh, op just recently opportunistic retail, which has been really fun, surprising. <laughs> and um, we've uh, we we just finished our fifth fund, so we don't have anything to invest in right now. But um, the folks on our email list know that. Um, that we will have a fund opening again uh, within two weeks, two weeks from tomorrow. So June 7th. Um, and that's going to be a similar fund. This is kind of cool. We're going to be adding RV parks. We actually wanted to add RV parks for years, but Steve, we weren't really willing to add RV parks until we were sure that we had a great operator. Uh, who would be able to, you know, who had a great track record, a great team, the technology, all that stuff that we always want before we invest. And so um, we found that company and we're finishing due diligence on them right now. So we're going to be adding uh, RV parks to the mix that I already shared. Is, is that enough? Is that is that cool? Yeah, no, that's great. I, I think they can go to wellingscapital.com to uh, get on mm -hmm. your list. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks for the question. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, let's see. David asked, let's see, what if you're only starting your investing journey in your 40s? And I'm not sure if he's asking for maybe how to yeah. diversify your portfolio. Who asked that, David? Uh, David Flowers. I don't, I don't know, David, if you want to get on uh, and talk uh, or need, be more specific. Yeah, sure. So obviously, um, it's a journey that takes time. And if you're in your 20s, you, you've got quite a bit of time to be a boring investor. But mm -hmm. later on in your mid-40s, which mm -hmm. I am, uh, do you have to use several strategies or can you only be a boring investor if you only have so much time left as an investor? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to give you two answers and then I'll circle back to actually try to answer the question. Uh, number one, um, I was, like I said, I was more of a speculator than an investor till I hit 50. You guys are probably saying he looks like 70. Is he 80? No, seriously, I'm 58. And I didn't really start investing really till I was 50. And um, 
So, and, and I've got a track record to prove it. I mean, I made money and I lost money um, a lot. And so, uh, so number one, you're not alone. I mean, and here's the crazy thing. Um, I don't have the exact number, but I think it's 95. Warren Buffett is 92 years old, or he's about to turn 92, maybe. Um, he uh, has made, I think it was 90 or 95% of his wealth since he turned 60. And it could even be 99% now that I'm thinking about it. Well, it's at least 95% now that I think about it. Yeah, Warren Buffett's made a lot since then. So that I hope that's encouraging to some people. Um, to answer your question, I don't think I have a one-size-fits-all answer, David. Um, like I said, I recently, as in the last few years, made a few speculative investments. And I mean literally just two um, on the side. Um, but, um, I don't think I have a one size fits all answer. Steve, what do you think? I don't know. Well, yeah, I've been, let's see, seriously investing in syndications, uh, for about five or six years now. Um, but I, I think it's, yeah, I think you have to yeah be boring, uh, because my, some of my first, yeah, th this presentation actually hits home really hard for me because, I, I was uh, chasing the shiny object syndrome. I was doing some resorts out of the country, uh, investing in coffee farms. And uh, out of all those investments, um, I've made pretty much zero dollars. So those were my early syndication investments. And then I kind of got um, boring and invested in apartment complexes, actually cash flow, self-storage, et cetera. So um, yeah, I think you, you need to have the bulk of your money in cash flowing assets because when you get the cash back early on, um, then you, you, you know, your, 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 your investments is, is safer because you're getting your return on capital. Um, and then also at the end, hopefully you'll have uh, you know, some nice appreciation, forced appreciation, and get a nice equity multiple at the end, and then you just recycle that money. So, um, I mean, that's, that's kind of my philosophy at this point, and uh, I'm trying to resist the shiny object syndrome as much as I can, although I keep getting kind of lured into it a little bit yeah. by little, but I do have a, a small percentage of my assets in, um, uh, in shiny object syndrome. So, yeah. um, but that's, but, but, but yeah, I, th I think, you know, with, if you invest a decent amount of your capital into cash flowing assets, a lot of that will be returned um, relatively quickly and you just keep, you know, rinse and repeat. And I think that's, uh, and, and I think it doesn't really matter how old you are. I think you can really, um, yeah. really rev that, rev that engine up. Yeah. Got it. I'm in chat by the way, right now. I think and that's, that, I think Steve, that was helpful. It was good to get your perspective because I wasn't sure how to answer that. Um, great question though. Adam, thank you for your kind, your question and your kind comments. I really appreciate it. Um, do we have time for more? Yeah, maybe one more. Tyson asked, uh, how do you draw the line between staying in your lane versus diversification across asset classes? I, I presume as a passive investor. Tyson, good to see you. Thank you for joining this evening. And um, I, Tyson, I don't know if this will help, but this is, so I became, I, I, I've convinced that you have to be obsessed, obsessively drivenly, is that a word? Um, focused on one thing like the guy with the Stanford, you know, maybe not that tight, but Stanford University perimeter thing. And so I think the answer to getting diversification and staying in your lane, especially if you want to be a passive investor, is to find those people who are obsessed with success and then investing in a bunch of them. Um, let me see if I can, if this helps. So uh, we, we talked about Michael Phelps. Well, Michael Phelps brought home 27 gold medals because he was obsessed with one thing, and that's swimming. Uh, but the U.S. team as a whole brought home a diverse group of medals, um, you know, gold, silver, and others, um, because everybody was obsessed with their own thing. And I think, you know, it, it would be like almost like being an American che cheering for the whole team. Uh, not just Michael Phelps to be diversified. So Tyson, I really think that, again, I think left field investors is the perfect place for that because I would, I told, was it, I told somebody today 
um, that uh, it's not good to like, even if you love my company or if you love somebody else you heard on left field investors, don't put all your eggs in that basket. Spread them out among a bunch of experts. All right. Well, we're coming on one hour on this uh, great uh, monthly meeting. Uh, thank you again, Paul, for your generous time and um, your stories and, uh, and also making us well aware of uh, human trafficking. That's um, obviously very heart wrenching and yeah. um, heartbreaking. So um, now we, we will have this networking after the meeting on wonder.me like we always have. You do have to be on a laptop or a computer. I put in the chat the, uh, the link. And then the password is LFI22. And then when you get on there, you can, if you've never been on there before, you actually can move your cursor around. And there's all these different uh, categories you can, you can go to. Um, and just uh, please log off of Zoom as well uh, when you do that. Um, and then, uh, Paul, you're certainly more than welcome to uh, chat with uh, some of our uh, left field investors if you like, if you have time. That would be happy to, love to, to have you. So, okay. All right, so let's. Um, I'll I'll keep this up for a little bit, and then you guys can go ahead and uh, head over to the um, Wonder Me if you want to get involved in the networking. All right, Steve. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Everybody, thank you so much. It was such an honor to be here. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks again, Paul. Thanks, Paul. You bet. All right.